I'd like to invite you, please, to just join me for a word of prayer as we look to the Lord uh, for, this, um, for this teaching. Father, we just ask that you would be with us today. And we thank you, Lord, for what has transpired, Lord God, today. The, the edification, the impartation that has happened, oh Lord. And we just thank you, Lord God, for filling our hearts, Lord God. And just um, equipping us with your word, oh Lord. And um, the testimony of um, our brothers and sisters who have, uh, you know, whom you have used today. And as we yield ourselves to you this afternoon, we pray that you would just be with us, Lord. I pray, O Holy Spirit, that you would be with me, that you would grant me, Lord, clarity of mind, clarity of speech, O Lord God, to be able to communicate your word to your, um, to your people. Just bring, bring a word of encouragement, O Lord God, a word of instruction as well to all of us this afternoon. And we just surrender this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I've entitled this message or this teaching this afternoon, King Saul, and that's, what, that's basically who we're going to be looking at, King Saul, how not to not end well, okay? How not to not end well. And I'm going to be speaking to you today about an important goal I believe we must have, you know, as men and women who are serving in the kingdom of God, who are being used whatever way, okay, whatever way you are being used, whether it's a Sunday school teacher, a children's church minister, a small group Bible study leader, a worship leader, a part of the worship team, an usher, you know, regardless of what position you may be, what, what role you may have in the church, okay, when you assume that role, you assume the role of a spiritual leader, okay, and I'd like to submit to you one goal, that I'd like to share with you this, uh, you know, this afternoon, and that is the goal of ending well, okay, of not just starting well, but ending well. You know, I remember the words of the Apostle Paul in his last letter, the last letter he wrote, um, and he wrote this to Timothy where he says, I have finished the race, okay, I've run it, and I've finished it, and now there awaits for me a crown, okay, that awaits for me because I have finished the race. And this is what I'd like to talk to you about this afternoon, really. How, you know, how not to not end well. How to avoid what I call or experience a spiritual shipwreck, okay, in our journey of faith and service. A shipwreck. Okay, that will not only affect us, but will affect many others around us as well. That our goal is one day, like the Apostle Paul, we are able to say, I have run the race. Okay, is the, um, are the PowerPoints good or are they still working on it? Okay. Sorry, some technical difficulties. This is the first time we've done this. And everybody, yeah, okay. Okay. So anyway, I like you know, I want to show you a picture, a picture of a shipwreck, okay. And what you're looking at actually is you know, a, um, what is considered the deadliest peacetime maritime disaster in history, okay? There are more people who died in this particular shipwreck than died in the Titanic, okay? And the interesting thing is this. This happened in the Philippines. The name of the ship was, is the MV Doña Pass, okay? It is a registered passenger ferry that sank after colliding with an oil tanker, the empty vector, on December 20, 1987, with an estimated death toll of 4,386 people. Okay. Only 24 survivors from this particular, you know, from this particular shipwreck, and it is considered the deadliest peacetime maritime disaster in history. 
Now, if you look at the history of the church, the history of leadership, not just, you know, leadership that's up there, but the history of the church, you will see and you can, you, you can probably point out certain people you know who have suffered some sort of a shipwreck, you know. Maybe it's discouragement. Maybe it's moral failure. Maybe it's um, disillusionment or whatever. But they started so hot in ministry and today they're no longer in ministry. They're no longer in serving the they're no longer serving the Lord. Tremendously gifted people, okay, very, very gifted, very, very passionate at the start. But because something happened along the way, okay, or they allowed something to happen to them, many of them are no longer part of the ministry right now. And some of them are no longer even are not are no longer in church anymore right now. And it's important for us to realize that it is not just important to start well, okay? It is important to end well, okay? Starting well is good, but ending well is better. You know, over the last several years, we have had many, many of our giants have gone home to be with the Lord. Men like Billy Graham, men like Ravi Zacharias, men like, um, you know, Reinhard Bonnke. Some of the biggest names in Christendom over the last 20, 30, 40 years. And many of them, you know, they, they, especially these three brothers of ours, they finished well. They started well and they finished well. Okay. Their reputation was intact. Their family was, was intact. In their legacy was intact. They, not just, they did not simply start well, but they ended well. So, you know, they ended well, all of them. And you know what? When I look at my life, when I look at what's going on with me right now, I say, Lord, I want to be like that. You know, 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road, when it's time for me, okay, to leave, okay, I'd like to go like they did, okay? I would like to end well. Now, we're going to be looking at the life, okay? I call this the tragedy of King Saul. The tragic story of King Saul as an example of somebody who started out quite well. But as we will see in his life, okay, and in his calling as the king of God's people, okay, he suffers a, ship, a shipwreck. A shipwreck that affected his destiny, okay. You know, we will see that he lost his kingdom. He lost his peace because he lost the presence of God. He lost his life and he lost his dignity. You know, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 26 to 28, you know, Saul does something foolish, okay? He offers a sacrifice when he's not supposed to offer the sacrifice. It was not his role to offer the sacrifice. But because he responds in fear and not in faith, in panic, okay, he does what he is not supposed to do. And then a confrontation where Samuel comes to him. Because the Lord tells Samuel, basically, I'm going to replace him. Okay? I'm going to replace him with somebody who is a man after my own heart. And Samuel says to Saul, you know, I'm not going to return with you, he says. Because Saul says, you know, would you, why don't you come with me to the people? Okay? He says, Samuel says, I'm not going to return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe and it tore. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Now his rule was going to continue past him. Okay. But, you know, past this particular this particular event he continued to rule for several years but he knew that it was going to be given to somebody else and we know that that somebody else was david and even though he still ruled israel for many years after this event it was a struggle as he no longer had the favor of god upon him and upon his reign in fact in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 14 to 15, it says, Now the Lord departed from, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. You know, 
how he lost the blessing of God's presence upon his life and upon his rule. Basically, he lost his peace. The, 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 the shalom, the peace that came with the presence of God was no longer there and it was replaced by a tormenting spirit. Basically, he started having mental health issues. He should have gone to the, the course of Pastor Richard Sampang earlier. Okay, on because he was having, you know, he was experiencing mental health issues and emotional turmoil. He was dealing with a tormenting spirit that brought harm upon him, that brought some form of depression upon him. And you know what? To lose the presence of God is the worst thing that can happen to us as his servants. Okay, to lose the sense of God's presence where we no longer sense his presence in our lives is the worst thing that we can happen because it is to lose our peace. And we have to be able to lead and minister and give from a position of peace. And it is basically to invite turmoil upon us. And then in 1 Samuel chapter 13, 31 rather, verses 8 and 10, you know, the last few moments of Saul's life, He's dead already by this point in time. He falls on his sword. Okay? He falls on his sword. And it says here that the next day, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount, Mount Gilboa. His, all his heirs, his son Jonathan and Jonathan's brothers died with him that day. So what happened is they cut off his head. And stripped off his armor. You know, the armor of a warrior was the dignity of a warrior. Okay? The, the, you know, the, the beauty of their armor spoke about who they were. Okay? They cut off his head and they stripped off his armor. And they sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the house of their idols and to the people. They put his armor in the temple of Ashtaroth and they fastened his bodies to the wall of Beth Shan. He not only loses his life, not only does all his sons die with him, but when they cut off his head, they stripped him, they stripped him of his armor. They displayed the armor in the temple of their God and they displayed his head okay, and fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan, a city there, he loses his dignity. Okay? His defeat and his shame were displayed to his enemies. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2 tells us that Saul was the most handsome man in Israel. Okay? And he stood head, above, head and shoulders above every other man in Israel. He was a towering physical presence, and he had movie star good looks. Okay. And yet at this point in time, okay, it's no longer the good-looking Saul. You know, he has the blood and the muck of battle on him. It's, the, it's a dirty face. It's an ugly, you know, it's an ugly face. And his defeat and his shame was displayed for all to see. It's a sad, sad story we read about King Saul. And yet this is, now, this is not how he started. This is not how King Saul started. Because if we, if, if we go to the start, we see that, you know, it's a good start. It's a positive start that he experiences. He's chosen by God to be the first king of Israel. And you read this in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1. Okay? He's anointed to be king over Israel. Chosen and anointed to be king over Israel. And God does a powerful work in his life by filling him with the Spirit of God. Aside from doing a deep, deep work in his life. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it says this. When he turned his back to leave Samuel, it says, God gave him another heart. God gave him another heart. Now, 
Gary McIntosh and Samuel Rima in their book, Overcoming the Dark Side of Leadership, talk about this. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to be quoting from, from here a, li a little bit. It says that the Hebrew here, which means God gave him another heart. The Hebrew here literally means that God replaced his heart with another heart. A heart that would enable him to lead the nation. A heart of courage, a heart of confidence, a heart of power. Because he was timid and he was afraid. God did, God did major spiritual heart surgery upon him and literally gave him a new heart. So God gives him another heart. And all these signs came to pass that day. When they came to Gibeah, behold, the group of prophets met him and the spirit of God rushed upon him and he prophesied among them. The Spirit of God rushed upon him. This tells him that God, you know, this affirms to him, basically, that God would be present with him as he assumed the kingship of Israel. And what happens here, basically, was a confirmation to Saul. God was confirming to Saul that indeed God had called him and would equip him, would enable him to fulfill the call upon his life that he would be a king and he could become the king and would become the king of the people so much so that you know it says in in, in first samuel chapter 11 verse 15 all the people went to gilgal and there they made saul king before the lord in gilgal there they sacrificed peace offerings before the lord and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. He had the support of Samuel. He had the support of the people. You know? And yet we ask the question. Yeah, we ask the question. How did it go from glory to shame? What caused the shipwreck in Saul's life? What caused the shipwreck, you know, in his kingship? How, how could such somebody who had such a positive and wonderful start end so bad? He had everything going for him. And yet, what a tragic end. What a, you know, what a tragedy. Now, the one thing I will tell you is this. Tragic ends do not happen overnight. They happen over a course, okay? A period of time. And what can we learn now from the narrative of Saul that will help us to end well? That will help us prevent suffering shipwreck in our journey of faith and service to the Lord? How do we avoid an ending like Saul's? Because the reality is this, we are not exempt from the threat. It can happen to us. Okay? It can happen to us. I'm reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul where he says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Because the reality is this, the potential for a tragic end is upon all of us. Okay, regardless of where we are at this point in time. And over the next several minutes, okay, probably 20 minutes, I'd like to share with you some important thoughts basically on how not to not end well. Okay, how not to not end well. Okay, and I have three thoughts basically from the life of King Saul that I would like to share with you as well you know, um, this afternoon. The first is this one, okay? Establish your altar. Establish your altar. Now, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 35, it says this, Saul built an altar to the Lord. Now, this is interesting, okay? Because it says, Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first altar that he built to the Lord. Now, this is several years into his kingship already. Okay. 
Now, for the writer to say, for the, the writer to state that Saul built an altar to the Lord would have been enough. Actually, okay, he built an altar to the Lord. But he adds something else by telling us that it was the first altar that he built to the Lord. It was not only the first altar that he built to the Lord. Some scholars actually say that it is actually the only altar that is ever mentioned that Saul built. Okay, The only altar that he built. Now what does this say about Saul? What does this say about his heart for God? What does this say about to us in relation to you know, his relationship with God? The fact that all throughout his kingship, okay, or up to that point, he only builds one altar to the Lord when it was customary during those times, really, to build altars to the Lord, to fellowship with Him, and to worship with Him. It tells us something very important. Paul did not have a, a Saul did not have a relationship with the Lord. He was not really a worshiper of the Lord. He was not through a He was not a very very spiritual person. He may have had knowledge of the ritual sacrifices of Israel. But his fellowship with the Lord was never really a priority in his life. You see, when you talk about an altar, you know, an altar to me speaks of worship. An altar speaks of fellowship. You know, an altar speaks to me about somebody like Abraham, who through the course we see in Genesis builds no less than four altars because of his desire to worship God, his desire to commune with God, his desire to fellowship with God, his desire for a growing relationship with his God and his creator. Abraham built four altars to the Lord at least because he had a heart that, was, that followed hard after God. He had a heart that truly belonged to the Lord. And we see this. Many of the great men of the Bible were altar builders. Abraham, Noah, Isaac, Jacob. They were altar builders. Because their hearts belonged to the Lord. And you see this. And now it's easy to understand why it was easy for Saul to disobey the word of the Lord. It was easy for Saul to make excuses okay, and to disobey the word of the Lord simply because his heart did not truly belong to the Lord. He wasn't an altar builder. Okay. And you see, leaders who finish strong have well-established altars. They are first and foremost worshipers of the Lord. They're what I call God chasers. Okay. And their priority, so much more than doing the work of the ministry, their priority is pursuing a growing relationship with the Lord. They seek communion with Him. Communion through his word, communion through prayer, communion through worship, through fasting, and all the other disciplines. Because communion is primary to them when it comes to the Lord. They are altar builders. They have established the altar of the Lord in their hearts. They know who they worship. They know who they belong to. They know who loves them and who they love. They know who their first love is. They know who the priority in their life is supposed to be. They know who they live for first and foremost. And this is seen in the way they pursue what I call altar time with the Lord. You know, personal communion and personal worship to the Lord. They spend time because they love Him, because the altar of God is well established in their hearts. Okay, Their heart belongs to God. They are men and women who are men who are after the heart of God, pretty much like King David was. 
And this is seen in their altar time. Whether it's reading the word of God, personal communion, okay, going to church, prayer, fasting. This is a part of their makeup and of their spiritual DNA. That's who they are. And that is, you know, that is what they do. And it is during, so, so they, you know, they spend time with God. They spend time in worship before the Lord because they are first and foremost worshipers of the Lord. And over the course of time, in my own personal altar times, okay, the times that I have spent with God personally, okay, I've discovered some things, some wonderful benefits of being, you know, of establishing my altar to the Lord. Okay. I've discovered that, you know, when, I, when, you know, it is during my altar time, okay, that I discover a security of identity. It is in my time with God that I discover and reinforce who I am in the Lord. I find my security of identity. I discover God's, God's heart of love for me in my altar time. But it is also during my altar time that many times I get strategic insight for the work of ministry. I receive guidance. I receive direction from the Lord in my time of prayer, in my time of worship in my time of engaging with his word that's when god many times speaks to me about you know the things that need to be done in ministry i get strategic insight it is the more time i spend with god the more sensitive i become to the spirit the greater my ability to hear from god better to make better decisions wiser decisions Decisions that are inspired by and led by the Spirit. And it is also in my altar time that I discover the Spirit, that I draw upon the spiritual strength that sustains me for the challenges of ministry. Many people ask me, you know, sometimes, Dad, you're a pastor, you're, you're like a machine. How do you do it? You know, how do you do it? Where do you find the energy? You know, the emotional energy, the spiritual energy, well, guess what? I find it in the altar. I find it in my altar time. I find it in my time of communion with God, my time of worship with the Lord. And the altar is a key to a leader's effectivity of ministry, in ministry. If you do not establish your altar, okay, in your heart, the altar of the Lord in your heart it will be very difficult for you to continue on and to you know and to move forward and it is something that you must prioritize before everything else as a leader does god have an altar in your heart establish that altar and a key to avoiding shipwreck in your life and ministry is to make sure that your altar with the Lord is well maintained. You know who your God is. You know who your king is. You know who your Lord is. And because the altar is there, there's nothing worse than an altar that hasn't been used. You use it. You commune with God. You spend time with God. You worship God. Now, a second is this one we will see. Okay. I've entitled this, No Monuments, Please. Saul wins a victory. He is commanded to destroy the Amalekites, and he destroys them, and he wins a victory. And, and it says here, Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel and behold, he set up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. Okay. He wins a victory. And the first thing he does is to set up a monument for himself. Now, it was common practice during those times for a king or a leader who won a victory in battle 
to set up monuments to commemorate those victories in order to honor themselves. And, you know, um, archaeologists have unearthed some of this. I think they're called, I don't know how, the steles, steles or stelis or whatever, where stone monuments, where carvings are there, where, you know, they can, um, you know, they, it tells of the battle and, and basically the glory is given to the king. It was basically a way of bragging, okay? A way of bragging or a way of making these kings feel good about themselves, now, Saul wins a victory over the Amalekites. And he probably wanted to broadcast his victory to everybody because he wanted to feel good about himself. He wanted everybody to look to him. He wanted the glory to go to him. Everybody to recognize him as a powerful war leader. But what he fails to do is acknowledge that God was the source of his victory. And that to give honor to God rather than to himself, he chooses to exalt himself rather than the Lord. Now, in his, again in the book, Overcoming the Dark Side of Leadership by Gary McIntosh and Samuel Rima, okay, he talks about, they talk about a narcissistic leader. And they say that one of the hallmarks of a narcissistic leader, one of the marks of a narcissistic leader is the need for admiration and constant attention from others. And in a sense, when Saul set up that monument to himself, okay, that's what he was looking for. He was looking for admiration. He was looking for affirmation. He was looking for attention. And instead of pointing the finger to God or pointing, you know, pointing to the Lord and giving glory to God and honoring him for the victory, he builds a monument to himself. Now, basically, this reveals the true, true content of his heart towards God. This tells us that his kingship was all about himself and not about the Lord. His ministry was all about himself. It was not about the Lord. But you see, leaders who finish strong do not build monuments to themselves no matter how gifted or successful they have become. They recognize that everything that they have, first and foremost, is from God. And their goal is always to seek to give God the credit for every blessing and every victory, and rightly so. Because every blessing and every victory that we achieve, okay, is because of the Lord. Ministry is never about them. It's about the Lord. And they always point people to the Lord, never to themselves. They always give God the credit. You see, in the ministry... One of the dangers of ministry, and I've seen this over the 30 plus years I've been involved in ministry, okay? There is a danger of using ministry to feel good about yourself or to meet your own need to be needed. There is a danger of starting to use the ministry to make, you know, to make you feel good about yourself. But down the road, this becomes counterproductive and destructive, not just to you, but those, to you, those you work with as well. Because it results in a toxic ministry. You know, it develops toxic relationships. And you become a toxic person. And that's what Saul became. He became a toxic person person and we will see this so but if it's not about you it's about the lord where you're just serving the lord regardless of okay you're not interested in building monuments to yourself you're you're interested in simply building the kingdom of god guess what it becomes pleasant. It becomes fulfilling. It becomes edifying. It becomes encouraging. It becomes energizing. 
And the key to finishing well is not to make ministry about yourself. It's not to set up any monuments to yourself. The key to finishing well is to make the focus of your ministry the glory of God, not the glory of man. Okay? The glory of God, not the glory of man. Now, a third one is this. Feedback is welcome. Okay. Feedback is welcome. Jonathan and his father, Saul, have a conversation in the family table. At this point in time, David is in the doghouse. Okay? He's no longer the favorite of Saul. In fact, Saul wants to kill him. Because Saul has seen him as a threat to his rule. Okay? And um, because, well, you know, he became very, very popular with the people. Very, very, very successful in everything that he did. So much so that the women were, say, were, were singing, you know, Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And when Saul heard this, they were saying, okay, this boy is a threat to my leadership. This boy is a threat to my reign. And my, you know, and basically uh, my kingdom. He's, you know, and he begins to recognize the potential, the tremendous potential David has. And he is very, very threatened. So he tries to destroy David. Now, during a family dinner, you know, David decides not to show up. But he tells Solomon, he tells Jonathan, I'm not going to show up. And in that dinner... John, um, um, Saul asks, where is David? He, you know, he's, he's trying to say it in a sarcastic way or really, really, his, his heart is not really um, honest about it, okay? He's very insincere. Where is David? Jonathan looks at his father and answers his father and says, why should he be put to death? What, is he, what has he done? Basically, he is questioning his father's decision, okay? Because he knows that it is a wrong decision. Not the right decision, a wrong decision. Because he believes that David was not deserving of such treatment. Now, Saul, he sees David as a threat to his rule. Because he already knows that God had decided to replace him. He sees that David has risen up and basically his ego is threatened. Okay. When Jonathan questions him, now mind you, Jonathan was not only a son, okay? Jonathan was a key leader in his kingdom. He was probably the heir of King Saul and was a valued counselor and commander in the kingdom. When he questions him, he resents the question. The feedback. And quite, you know, honestly, he responds very violently, violently against Jonathan. He picks up a spear and he hurls the spear and he tries to kill his son. Think about that. He responds very violently. Now again, in the book, you know, Overcoming the Dark Side of Leadership, they talk about paranoid leaders. Paranoid leaders that may overreact to even the mildest form of criticism or critics. Saul has developed or exhibits a my way is the highway model of ministry. I am right. You have no right to question me. I'm the leader. You have no right to question me. Nobody is allowed to question his decision. He becomes controlling and rigid in the way he leads. Now, this is born out of an insecure heart. Most controlling leaders, you know, most my way is the highway kind of leaders. They're very insecure. Okay. Those who do not do not value input and feedback and sometimes even criticism, they, that's because of an insecure heart. And Saul had a very insecure heart. Why? Because he didn't have a relationship with God. You find a secure, your security in your relationship with God. 
Now, the danger here, the danger is that especially in leadership, okay, when you have a my way is the highway model of leadership, okay, when you are controlling and rigid, no questions, please, to my decisions, is eventually the load of leadership is carried by one man alone. You carry the load of leadership, and it's never intended like that by God. God, there is wisdom in the counsel of many. And this can lead to severe burnout for the leader or a shipwreck for, you know, the leader. You know, I was, I was looking at this. I was looking at this exchange. And if you have your Bibles, you go down to verse 34. And it says something very telling there. It says, Jonathan left the table in fierce anger and refused to eat on that second day of the festival. For he was crushed by his father's shameful behavior toward David. You know what this tells me? Saul lost moral authority over his son. His credibility just crashed, crashed. Now, Jonathan stayed with him probably out of a love for a son, for a father. Okay, out of loyalty in relation to that. But this alienated his son from him. And this, this destroyed his credibility, his leadership credibility over his, over his son. And that is what can happen. That is what can happen. And you see, leaders who last and finish well have learned to receive feedback and input from those they work with. Leaders who last and finish well give permission to those they work with to question them or to speak into them correction or even rebuke when necessary. They exercise or they practice what they call a humble accountability. They recognize that they're not perfect. They recognize that they have blind spots. And they recognize that the feedback or the input of those around them is important if progress whether it is personal or professional, is going to be achieved. They recognize that the, but that, the, that the feedback, the questions, the input, the correction that those around them bring become a form of protection for them. And so they are inviting of that. They're not insecure. They are inviting in relation to that. Your feedback is important. Your feedback is valued. Because they know that if they're going to grow, if they're going to progress, if they're going to move forward, if they're going to become better as human beings, better as leaders, better as disciples, better as Christian workers, better as followers of Jesus Christ, they need to give people permission to speak into their lives. Now, unfortunately, what we see here, Saul did not do that. And this probably, this led, you know, I believe that this led to, you know, this is one factor that led to his demise and his shipwreck. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to ministry work, Okay, when it comes to ministry work, leaders, they invite, you know, they invite actually collaboration. They invite consensus with the leaders that they work with because they know that they don't have all the answers. They know that they are not the sole source of ideas and inspiration. They welcome and they celebrate the giftedness and contribution of those around them. You know what? What happened here? This weekend, in spite of everything, this is not the work of one man. This is the work of a team. This is the work of the worship ministry, the media ministry, the teaching ministry. This is, the, it is a collaboration of everybody. This, a lot of it was discussed, okay? 
and it was not the decision of one person, you know, the one person alone. So they're not afraid to admit that others may have better ideas than them. Or they're not even afraid to admit that they made the wrong decision and they need to change course. And what happens is the leadership load is shared and energies are not depleted. Energies are reserved. And they are able to continue on. So a key to starting and finishing well to cultivate a humble heart. The kind of humility that welcomes feedback, the kind of humility that welcomes input from others, the kind of humility that values the giftedness and contributions of those around them. The kind of humility that says, I can't do it alone. I need people with me. So at the end of this, basically, the key to starting and finishing well is the posture of a leader's heart. It starts and it ends with the heart. Yeah. And leaders that start and finish well, first and foremost, they have a heart for God. They pursue a growing personal relationship with God. They've established the altar of God in their hearts. They are worshipers before they are anything else. Their devotion to God is not questionable. The lordship of God is not question, questionable, okay? It's not questioned. It is established. And they have a heart to glorify God. Ministry is not about them. It's not about their needs. It's not about their desires. It's not about their glory. They always seek to give the credit and glory to Him. But they have humble hearts as well. They are not defensive. They are not resentful when feedback, when criticism, when input is given to them. And they welcome being accountable to others. I believe that we establish these three major points. Our heart for God, our heart for God's person, okay? A relationship with Him. A heart that seeks the glory of God. A heart that is humble and receives input, criticism, feedback. Allows people to speak into our lives. You know what? We will not only start well, we will end well. And you see, brothers and sisters, let's end well. Amen? I'd like to call Ella up here in front, please. I'd like to just end with this song, okay? And fortunately, I'm not going to be the one who's singing it. Ella will sing it. Okay, because if I sing it, then this conference will not end well. Okay. And I'd like to invite you to just, um, just, just, just bow your heads and just put yourself in a posture of prayer and of worship to the Lord. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. That's our prayer today, Lord God, as we end this day's event, oh Lord, and we just thank you for everything. Lord, um, we are here to just consecrate our hearts to you once again. We thank you for the privilege that you have played, laid upon us, the honor of calling us to become part of the work that you are doing in this world bringing forward the cause of Christ, establishing your kingdom in this world, in the hearts and in the minds of people, O oh Lord. And Lord, we want to become leaders that exhibit, O oh Lord God, an exemplary character. We want to be leaders, O oh Lord God, who not only start well, but end well. And Lord, we pray because we know that apart from you, it is impossible, Lord God. We can study, we can learn all we want. But ultimately, Lord God, it is the grace that you make available to you, to us, that will enable us, oh Lord God, not just to start well, but to end well. And that's my prayer. That's my prayer for myself. That's my prayer for everybody, oh Lord God. Everybody who's here, everybody who's watching, Lord God, be it through Zoom or Facebook Live everybody who listens to this that Lord we will start well we will end well we will avoid the kind of shipwrecks that have that have just that 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 that, that you know as we look back at history Lord God we see so much of this that's affected negatively the body of Christ and the cause of Christ that Lord like the Apostle Paul we will be able to say I have run the race, I've finished it, and now there awaits for me the crown of righteousness. And that's our prayer, Lord God, that every waking moment of our lives, oh Lord God, our lives will be focused on giving you the glory, the honor, and the praise. So thank you, Lord. To you we give the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.